the makers of Chasen Sanborn Coffee, the blend of the world's choice coffees, which is now so very reasonable in price, present Josephine Hutchinson, Dorothy Lamour, W.C. Fields, Jose Iturbi, Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy, Werner Jansen, Don Amici. This is the Chase and Sanborn Hour. This is the Chase and Sanborn Hour, and this is Don Amici bidding a hearty welcome to Jose Turby, who is one of the great pianists of our day, and to Miss Josephine Hutchinson, whose many outstanding performances in the New York theater won her an immediate place among the brightest stars and pictures. Mr. E. Turby and Miss Hutchinson join our regular company, W.C. Fields, Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy, Dorothy Lamour, and Werner Jansen, America's foremost conductor who leads the orchestra in the top tune of the day. Its title, Carelessly. hat a little on one side and monocle a bit foggy, Charlie McCarthy is still at large, followed anxiously by Edgar Bergen, without whom Charlie would just be a funny-looking wooden doll. But with two-voiced Edgar Bergen to speak for him, Charlie is well on the way to earning the title of public nuisance number one. Nevertheless, we're all very fond of Charlie, and we hope he is fully recovered from last week's slight indisposition. No, doubt. <clears throat> I'm sorry to say that Charlie has not improved. And although I've done my best as a practicing physician... Ah, uh, yeah. I wish you'd stop practicing. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm sorry, Charlie, but your tonsils, they, they must come out. Is that so? Yes. Uh, you mean you'll have to... Uh... I'm afraid so. Uh, but, Doctor, I feel better. You do? Yes. I feel better. You do? Uh-huh. I got you there, huh? No, no, no. no. <laughs> I felt better as soon as I saw your slaughterhouse. Wait a minute here. That doesn't make a bit of difference, young man. No, no. Not even if I feel good? Not even if you feel good. Oh, you hate to lose a customer, don't you? Yes, I do. <laughs> yes. Well, now, let's talk this thing over, Doctor. Yes. I, um, I suggest we postpone this thing until tomorrow, huh? No, no. Let's get an early morning start at the crack of dawn around 11.30. No, no. no. <laughs> I think we better do it now. But I would much rather do it tomorrow. It doesn't make any difference what you'd rather do. Oh, doesn't it? Not a bit. Uh-huh. Well, that's another way of looking at it. <laughs> I thought maybe as a favor. No, no, it wouldn't make a bit of difference. Well, I certainly got a drag around here. Yes. <laughs> you understand, young man, I'm trying to help you. That's good of you. Yes. <clears throat> I guess there's no use kidding myself. I have suffered. Of course you have. <gasps> oh, how I've suffered. <laughs> oh, I suffer all the time. Yes. But it doesn't help. No. I don't think I'm suffering right. Maybe you're not. <laughs> there must be a knack to it. Yes. Yesterday I was so weak, doctor. I was so weak I couldn't even raise my voice. Is that so? 
I just sat and hung my head. That's the only exercise I had. Yeah. Uh, how much do you charge for an operation like this, Doctor? Well, of course, I always strive to be considered. Well, that's nice. Yeah. For this operation, I will charge anywhere from nothing at all up to $300. Hey, that's all. Yeah. Oh. Well, I'll take one for nothing at all. Yeah. <laughs> and don't skimp on anything either. No. <laughs> I want hand sewing and all that sort of thing. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, that's me all over. Oh, Miss Lamour, uh, are the instruments sterilized? Yes, Dr. Bergen, they're boiling. So am I. <laughs> yes, I have everything ready for the operation, so let's proceed. Yes. Um, oh, nurse, uh, uh, <clears throat> why are you and the doctor all dressed up in white? For your operation. Is that so? That's nice of you. I didn't know I was going to have a formal opening. Oh, <laughs> I should have worn my tuxedo. Yes, you should have. I'll wear a black dress if you like, Charlie. No, no, I think you look much better than white. Uh, with you for my nurse, I'm going to be sick for a long time. My beautiful one. Your eyes are like... A... That will do, young man. Yeah. Put your head down. Yeah, well, don't push me. Just, well, don't push me, you hear? Oh, no. <laughs> don't shove. All right. I'll clip you. All right. I'll mow you down. <laughs> Get the idea? I get the idea. Yes. I'm a customer here. Yes, I know. I want service and courtesy. Yes, all right. What's the idea of covering me up, nurse? You must keep nice and warm. Oh. I'm not cold. <laughs> not yet. I may be cold by tomorrow. <laughs> I don't feel so hot now. <laughs> oh, that's too bad. How's your pulse? Oh, just ducky. How's yours? <laughs> The anesthetic, please. Uh, no, I don't want any of that stuff. Oh, it won't hurt you at all. You'll drift on and on into oblivion. Is that so? I hope it's a round trip. <laughs> now, don't forget to count every time you take a breath. Yeah, I'll fool you. I won't breathe. <laughs> oh, doctor. Yes, Charlie. If uh, if the worst should come to the worst. Yes. If I should uh, decease her. Yes. Uh, would you see that Skinny Dugan gets my bicycle? Oh, I see. If you die, you want to leave your bicycle to Skinny Dugan? Yes. He's my pal. Well, I shall see that Skinny will get your bicycle. Yes. Uh, what? Well, of course. <laughs> <laughs> only, only if you should die. Yes. Yeah. But you don't have to go out of your way, you know. No. <laughs> Put your head down. Yes. Now, let me cover your eyes. Uh -huh. Now, start counting. A one, a two... <laughs> Oh, I smell embalming fluid. <laughs> now take a nice, deep breath. I can see Skinny riding my bicycle. <laughs> oh, redwood for an old, so I'll get even with fields. That bird in the fake, too. Clang, clang. I feel so foolish. <laughs> Good evening, Dr. Bergen. I heard you were operating, and I just dropped in to see if there were any prospects. Glad you called. Stand by, Mr. Gearfob. Oh, well, where am I? How long have I been sleeping? Is the operation over? No, Charlie. We haven't started yet. No? No. I want you to meet my very good friend here, uh, Mr. Don Amici Gearfob. No. The undertaker. How do... Whoa! <laughs> Wait a minute. Aren't you a little early here? Is it? Say, is this operation serious? Oh, no, no, no. No? Have you lost many patients, Doctor? Only two of my patients have died. Only two? Uh huh. How many have you had? You're my third. Yeah, let me out of here. <laughs> let me out of here. Few men so young are as famous in the world of music as Jose Iturbe. He has played concerts in every quarter of the globe, conducted nearly all of the world's leading symphony orchestras and is one of the greatest pianists alive today. We consider it an honor and are very happy indeed to present Jose Turbi playing a piano solo written by one of his countrymen, Manuel de Feya, the stirring ritual fire dance. Jose Turbi. <laughs> Thank you. 
easy to see why Jose Tolby is acknowledged one of the world's greatest pianists. That's true, Mr. Amici, very true. But can he play chopsticks? <laughs> well, with enough practice, Charlie, I really believe he can. But you'll have to postpone that burning question for a while. Jose Torby is going to play again later. Yeah, I'll postpone, but I'll ask you, betcha. Yes, I betcha. <laughs> but why don't you just forget the whole matter while we hear from Donald Briggs. The warm weather that's just ahead gives us a chance to enjoy one of the most satisfying drinks ever created. A tall, refreshing, frosty glass of iced coffee. Now, there's a knack to making really delicious iced coffee. It pays to remember that melting ice dilutes the coffee. So in order to get full, rich flavor, make your coffee somewhat stronger than usual. And be sure to use the blend that gives you extra goodness, Chase and Sanborn coffee. Chase and Sanborn dated coffee is a blend of the world's choice coffees. And you get it at the peak of its marvelous flavor. For as soon as it's roasted, it's rushed to your grocer, plainly marked with the date of delivery. That date is your guarantee of freshness. Your protection against flat, stale-tasting coffee. Your assurance of full, rich, satisfying flavor. And dating saves you money, too. It enables us to pack the superb coffee in economical dated bags instead of expensive containers. And the saving goes to you. Enjoy this finer, fresher coffee. It's delicious, either hot or iced. Buy a pound of Chase and Sanborn dated coffee from your grocer tomorrow. A swell song is always a swell song. But when Dorothy L'Amour sings it, somehow it sounds, well, even sweller. That's because Dorothy's vivid personality is in everything she does. Whether she's playing a dramatic part before a movie camera or singing a popular song like Beginner's Luck. I've got beginner's luck The first time that I'm in love, I'm in love with you Gosh, I'm lucky I've got beginner's luck There never was such a smile or such eyes of blue This thing we've begun Is much more than a pastime For this time is the one Where the first time is the last time I've got beginner's luck Lucky through and through Cause the first time that I'm In love, I'm in love With you about playing chopsticks. Now, please, Charlie, not now. Only a little while ago, at the Civic Repertory Theater in New York, Josephine Hutchinson won the hearts of even the stoniest critics with her beautiful performances and her ability to step from Russian tragedy into the low-heeled slippers of Alice wandering through Wonderland. For us, Josephine is going to play the part of Kitty Vane in The Dark Angel. I'm going to play her sweetheart, Alan Trent, and I think no one could ask for a lovelier, more appealing Kitty Vane than Miss Josephine Hutchinson. Thank you very much, Don. The 
Dark Angel. It is 1919 at a cottage in the English countryside. Alan Trent, who lost his sight in the World War, is sitting alone in his room when the landlady's children knock at his door. Yes? May we come in, Mr. Trent? Oh, no. Come on, Sadie Cat. My brother wanted to look at you, Mr. Trent. He's never seen a blind man. Oh, are you cross with us? No, no. No, look at me by all means. Oh. I'm glad I'm amusing. (laughs) Why now? What's all this? Oh, now don't cry, please, please. Here, where is that handkerchief? Here we are, there now. You're little Miss Gallup, aren't you? Yes, and, and this is my brother, Joe. How do you do? It was kind of you to come and see me. Shall we sit down? There's a big chair somewhere around. It's over here, sir. We'll pull it up for you. Oh, thanks. I I thought you were angry. You weren't, were you? No, Betty. I'm never angry with little boys and girls. You know, I write books for boys and girls. You do? Yes. I once had two boys and girls myself. Make-believe boys and girls. Just for a few minutes. You did? Only for a few minutes? Yes. But that was a long time ago. It was at a little inn in Folkestone. You see, I was going to the war and I was saying goodbye to someone I love very much. And such a beautiful lady. (laughs) And the flowers. Where did you find them? Oh, they were just growing. I picked them for you. Oh, you darling. You're still a child. Oh, Alan. I can't bear to have you go. I don't dare even think about this war. Don't you think I'm afraid, too? But most of all, I'm frightened about you. That you'll change while I'm gone. But I'll never, never change. You know that. Oh, Darling, I love you so much. I always will. Always? Oh, my dear. I wanted to hear that so badly. Oh, but, darling, surely you know. But I've never really been sure. Might be just because we've grown up together. You see, I've always been around. I know. When I first looked through the bars of my crib, there you were. When I saw my first tree, you were in it, peering down. My first bird, my first squirrel. You were always there. But that's what makes me afraid sometimes. You may be just used to me. You may meet some other girl. Why, you sweet idiot, don't ever say that. Why, if if you weren't there, I'd... I'd stop living. We'll always be together, Ellen. When you come back. Always. Ellen, what's that noise? It's just the guns in France, Kitty. You can hear them from the coast when the wind is this way. They frighten me. And all those men we passed coming down here. Thousands and thousands of them. All going to war. All leaving someone. In a little while, you'll be gone with the rest of them. You... Now, listen, darling. We've got to play a game. But I can't. Will you I... play, Kitty? Yes. Yes, Ellen. We must pretend there are no goodbyes tonight. And that the only time I'll ever have to leave you for the rest of our lives is to buy us both a loaf of bread and a bottle of milk. And, and we've really been married for years, haven't we, Ellen? Instead of just engaged. Our children are all sitting around the table. Don't you see them? Oh, yes, there's Agatha and Bertram... Alan, uh, don't you think the children should be in bed? Now, first, I want to say a few words to them, my dear. <clears throat> Agatha and Bertram, Mamie and Harold, this is your parents' 25th wedding anniversary. 15th, Alan. Now, my dear, please. Children, 25 years ago today, your mother married your father. Your mother was a lovely sight. And your father, children. Kitty, can't you do anything with Mamie? She just bit little Harold. Mimi, come to order. Now, as I was saying... Your father was the finest, dearest, kindest. Your father loved your mother as no one has ever loved before. I I can't play anymore. Listen to those guns. Now, don't don't hear them, darling. Here. I'll cover your ears. I've got to go now. But, Kitty, I love you. I will always love you. Oh, darling. (laughs) Darling. (laughs) Darling. you loved your children, didn't you, Mr. Trent? Even if you only had them for a few minutes? Yes, I loved them very much. 
Come here and let's have a look at you, Betty. How can you? With my fingers. Let's see now. Oh, why, well, this is a nice, perky little face. Turned up nose. Dimpled chin. Now I know just what you're like. <laughs> now do, Joe. Like to have a look at me? Oh, I, I beg your pardon, Mr. Trent. There's someone to see. Well, what on earth are you children doing in here? We were only... Well, Mr. Trent is going to... Go stop. right out. Go on oh, now. Dear. Go on. Hurry. Someone to see me, Mrs. Mellon? It's a lady, sir. A Miss Bain. Mm -hmm. Kitty. Will you see her? Yes. Yes, I'll... I'll see her. Oh, Joe. Joe, tell the lady to come up. Uh, Mrs. Gallup, is this room as it usually is? Any, uh, furniture changed about it? Uh, I must be absolutely certain. This lady must not know I'm blind. Everything's right in its place, Mr. Trent. It's fine, fine. My pipe here on the tray. Yes, that's all right. Mm. Matches. Cigarettes on the table. Uh... Uh, what what kind of flowers are in the bowl today? Yellow tea roses. Tea roses. I, I must remember that. Mrs. Gallup, what is it like to live day in and day out with a blind man? Why, Mr. Trent, I, I don't think of you as blind. Aren't you watching every minute for fear I'll fall? For fear you'll say something? Right in there, ma'am. Oh, here she comes. I'll slip through the bedroom so she won't move it out. Alan. Alan, darling. Kitty. It's really, really you. I never believed you died in France. I always knew that sometime, somewhere... I'm very glad to see you, Kitty. Here's a comfortable chair. Cigarettes right there beside you. I looked you. for you everywhere. I wrote all the hospitals, but not a trace, until Mother saw you walking down the road. Uh, have a cigarette, Kitty. The matches are on the table. Ellen, what's the matter? Ellen, why are you hiding? It's a whole year since the armistice. Ellen, where have you been? Why, here in the country, writing books for children... Here, so close to me, and you never let me know. Do uh, you mind if I have a pipe? I'll show you around the garden later. I'm terribly proud of my tea roses. Just uh, look at those yellow ones in the bowl. Pretty, aren't they? Ellen, what's happened to us all these months? Not knowing, and now you talk of roses. Uh, there's very, very little to tell, really. Will you suffer, darling. Something's hurt you. Ellen, tell me. Well, it, it's hard to tell you, Kitty, but... I've changed. Changed? After all, a war doesn't leave you quite where it found you. I spent months in a hospital, months in a prison camp. And when I came out, I I wanted to be alone, alone. for a while. Alone? Oh, Ellen. I always meant to come back someday, but... Well, I, I just didn't get around to it. Ellen, look at me. Why don't you look at me? You stopped loving me. Is that it, Ellen? I love you, Kitty. In a, a different way. I see. I understand. Forgive me, Ellen. I, I've been making it difficult for you. I should have known that things wouldn't be the way they were. This means we won't see each other again. It would be better if we didn't, Kitty. Very well. But before that happens, Ellen, I want to tell you that I loved you then. I love you now with all my heart. Kitty, I, I did love you. I never loved anyone else. I never will. Goodbye, my dear. I won't bother you again. Goodbye, Kitty. Come in, Mrs. Gallup. She's gone. And she never guessed. I think I managed very well. But I'm very, very tired. <laughs> Mrs. Gallup. Are you there? Who is it? Who's standing there? Alan. Oh, my darling, my darling. <laughs> now I understand. You couldn't see me. You couldn't tell me that Kitty, you were... Kitty, don't. I'm here, darling. Right in front of you. Put your arms around me. Hold me tight. Kitty, stop. Think what it means. Years and years of waiting on me, taking care of me. But it means I'll be alive again, Ellen. How could you know me so little? I'm blind, Kitty, blind. Worse than a baby to take care of. You'll never be alone again, darling. Wherever you are, I'll be with you. Always. Always. <laughs> Miss 
Hutchinson and myself. Thank you. The Chase and Sanborn Hour with W.C. Fields, Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy, Josephine Hutchinson, Dorothy Lamour, Jose Torby, and Werner Jansen continues in just a moment. Bum, bum, bum. Can you hear me, Mother? <laughs> oh, now, Mr. Amici, you know, chopsticks, uh, eternity, yes, no, no? No, I'm sorry, not now, Charlie. Later. <laughs> Werner Jansen and his orchestra play a medley of songs written by a man whose gift for appealing melody never fails, Irving Berlin. For years, we've listened to his tunes, danced to them, asked for them, and looked forward to them. And I'm sure you'll recognize your old favorites and some new ones, too, in The Berlin Fantasy.
battered hat is a joy to behold. His bulbous nose is a warning signal, especially to Charlie McCarthy. His crooked cane is a magic wand. They all merge to produce W.C. Fields. Well, how are you feeling, Bill? I'm feeling fine, Don. I just finished reading the synopsis of my new picture, The High Cost of Dying. <laughs> They're making it over. Now, please, perma- please, Bill. You must absolutely refrain from using any names on this program. I got a letter today from Chase. Uh, well, you know who I mean. Yeah, Chase, I know. Did Sanborn right? <laughs> I got a letter from the both. I'll read it to you. There it is. Mr. W.C. Fields, Esquire. Care of Townsend Club, <laughs> Idlewild Lodge, local number six, Cucamonga, California. <laughs> now, please, yes, uh, please, Bill, do you have to read all that? Oh, uh, just a moment. Uh, dear W.C. Bill, there's no use going any further. <laughs> yeah, that's far enough, yeah. <laughs> We're calling your attention to your remarks of the 29th of the moment. You know, cards will be forced to communicate with you prior to the six proxima. <laughs> What's all this other more proximal business? I don't know, and I don't care. Oh, so you won't be dragged into it, eh? <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, Chase and Sandbar. Now, Bill, please. I'm still reading. <laughs> Paramount. I guess there's no way to put a stop to this. <laughs> right there, I'd, I'd be patient on him, ain't I? In conclusion, we tell you... All we seem to hear from you each week is paramount, paramount, Bill, paramount. Now, Bill, now, Bill, 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 listen. Yours most respectfully, Chase and Sandbar. Well, that's over with. Uh, P.S., please remember. Oh, now, Bill, Bill, this name business is growing into elephantine proportion. Oh, yeah, that reminds me. Did I tell you the story about the elephant? Yes, Bill. Yes, you talked about that elephant picture last week and exhausted the subject completely. And oh. me, too. Uh, did I tell you about scurvy breaking out amongst the extras? Yes, you did. <laughs> did I tell you there weren't enough ambulances to take them off the hospital? I didn't tell you that, did I? No, you didn't tell me that. Oh, there you are. <laughs> we tied a Pullman car on the side of an elephant and packed uh, the extras into that. One big, strong elephant called Tom... Did I tell you about Tom? <laughs> no, you didn't, but don't bother. Oh, uh, we strapped the dining car on each side of him. He carried one under his trunk. We tried to hang one on his tail, but he wouldn't stand for it. <laughs> Every time he tried to switch the flies off him, we had a train wreck. <laughs> well, uh, what happened when you got to the hospital? Oh, yes. Yeah. Clang, clang, clang. What is the sound I Bill, have? Bill, Bill, Bill. The ambulance is coming. Bill, Bill, you've got this all mixed up. It isn't you going to the hospital this time. This was the extras. Oh, yes. Thanks, Don. Thanks yeah. very much. <laughs> on the way to the hospital, one of the porters left a window open in the Pullman car. And the elephants caught scurvy. <laughs> you ever hear of elephant scurvy? No, I can't say that I did. I remind me to tell you about it. <laughs> All the elephants caught scurvy except Sophie. I once had an aunt named Sophie. She tried to do away with herself by hurling her buxom body at the rear of a train. Well, wait, a a train... Minute. wait a minute, Bill. Huh? People usually hurl themselves in front of a train. Uh, everybody does, yes, that's right. But Aunt Sophie was very backward. <laughs> And you know, Don, she's as hale and hearty today as though she'd never taken a drink in her life. Now, look, look, Bill. What happened when the elephants got to the hospital? What'd you say? I said, what happened when the elephants got to the hospital? Oh, they wouldn't let them in the hospital. They gave some... Yeah, they gave us some lame excuse about the beds all being occupied. <laughs> Don, did we get into trouble with those uh, elephants? Pull up your chair, man. I want and to uh, speaking of old devil trouble, here comes Charlie McCarthy. Uh, Say, uh, Bill, I don't think you ought to continue having any arguments with him. Everybody's talking about your feud. I wouldn't dignify him by having a feud. Oh, don't be vindictive, Bill. I'm not vindictive, but I certainly don't want that cord of wood on my knee. <laughs> If Bergen wants to sit there, it's okay. But I don't want any part of him, Don. Did you ever get oak poisoning? (laughs) No. 
Oh, I look out for that guy. Bill, I, I really believe he, he... Oh, don't talk nonsense. You'll get people to thinking I don't like the rat. <laughs> Bill, will you shake hands with him? And get splinters in my finger? <laughs> Positively, no. Why, that little rat... Shh, quiet, quiet. Wait a minute, Bill. Well, hello, Charlie. Oh, hello, Mr. Nietzsche. Uh, hello, Mr. Field. Watch me being polite. Greetings, my diminutive little chum. <laughs> I trust you are feeling fit this evening. Oh, thank you, Mr. Fields. I hope you're feeling fit. I am fit to be tied. <laughs> yeah, well, Mr. Fields, I brought you a bouquet of flowers. What's he talking about now? As a token of my friendship. A little nosegay. Uh-uh, here it comes. No. <laughs> I hope you'll like it. Hmm. I've taken enough from that guy. Why, what's the matter, Bill? Look at that nosegay. <laughs> Dog blossoms, poison ivy, and redwood for a nosegay. <laughs> Redwood for a nosegay and an ample bit of it, too. I'll... Yeah. <laughs> go away. Go away or I'll throw a grub on you. <laughs> Bill, don't be too angry with Charlie. He isn't feeling well today. He needs a doctor. He needs a tree surgeon. <laughs> he didn't know when I was reading to Dorothy Lamar about burning of redwood at the opening of the new San Francisco Bridge, I heard him say, Fields better keep his nose out of that. <laughs> Go away, leprosy. Now, did I ever tell you the director of our picture got leprosy? No. Yeah, they sent him to Molokai. We had to keep the extras on at half salary. The extras of half salary? Yeah, for 18 years. <laughs> Pending the director's recovery. Well, uh, did he ever recover? Oh, yes. The day he got back, the extras formed a group, making a welcoming speech and presented him with a fitted portmanteau. That means traveling bag. <laughs> yes, I know. I thought you did. Did I ever tell you about my grandmother's portmanteau? This was my grandmother on my father's side. She was on his hip for years. A great companion. She was a drunkard, too. Bill, they gave the director a portmanteau. Oh, yeah, you know about it, eh? No, no, I'm merely quoting you. Oh, they gave him a completely fitted portmanteau. A grip. That's a... Cabba, keister, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I know, Bill. Are, are you well, going on? Well, fully equipped with sleeping shoes, Eskimo muck locks, folding golf clubs, wire-haired brush, a wire-haired tarrier to match, an old-fashioned razor, a set of dueling pistols, and a picture of the great commoner, William Jennings Bryan. <laughs> Imagine the extras putting together their little mite to show their gratitude and regard for that director. Yeah, they also gave him a letter. And a lavender envelope. Fully scented, demanding double pay and leprosy insurance. <laughs> well, that was only fair. Ah, uh, but now comes the interesting part of the picture. Two elephants. Uh, excuse me, Bill. One is the Excuse me, Bill. Just a minute. I'd like you to meet Miss Hutchinson. Oh, yeah. How do you do, Miss Hutchinson? How are you? Two elephants. Bill, Tom. Bill, Bill. What? This is Miss Josephine Hutchinson. Uh, this is Mr. Fields, Miss Hutchinson. How do you do, Mr. Fields? Oh, yeah, how are you? Two elephants, Don. Bill, Bill. You know Josephine, don't you? Oh, yes, yes. I knew Napoleon, too. <laughs> My father owned two skeletons of Napoleon. Yeah, I know. <laughs> one when he was a little boy and one when he was grown up. Oh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I'm beginning to like Charlie McCarthy. <laughs> well, anyhow, you ought to know Josephine Hutchinson. Remember that grand performance she gave as Alice in Alice in Wonderland? Oh, yes, yes. How are you, Alice? No. <laughs> Bill, look. Miss Josephine Hutchinson played Alice in Wonderland. Oh, what do you think of that? That's remarkable. That's marvelous. What a coincidence. All right, Josephine, how are you? We had two elephants. One was a... Uh, uh, I'm feeling two... fine. I wish you were the same. Yeah, I wish I could, too. I had two elephants once. Yeah, I know. You had two elephants. 
But, uh, uh, Miss Hutchinson, how about that famous Jabberwocky poem that Lewis Carroll wrote in Alice in Wonderland? We'd like to hear that, wouldn't we, Bill? Speak for yourself. <laughs> Let me out of this. Why don't you get rid of her? I want to tell you about the elephant. Bill, Bill. Uh, Alice in Wonderland. Oh, yes, I know. I played the egg in the picture version. Oh, really? Uh, I know. You must have been the egg that fell off that 12-foot wall. What a memory you have. <laughs> Mr. Fields, I've often wondered, when you fell off, off that wall, did you crack up? I didn't bounce. Uh, Miss Hutchinson, how about Jabberwocky? Oh, the poem sounds rather silly, but it's amusing. So I fear nothing, and here goes. Twas brillig and the slithy toes... Did she say did... slimy toes? <laughs> Quiet, Bill. Oh, did Gaia and Gimble in the wave... Where oh. are she and her cups? <laughs> 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 All mimsy were the borrow goves and the mome rust outgraved. Beware the jabberwock, my son. Why well, don't you jo- stop her? She's had too much liquor in her coffee. <laughs> That's wonderful, Miss uh, Henderson. Wonderful. <laughs> Did you ever. Hey, John, did you ever hear this one? Really cob, really cob, brittle cob, troll, rule, rap, floor, truly obrob, mock, mature, draw, creepy crants, broom. Pretty little thing, actually, cut out. Bill, that's great. But Miss Hutchinson was reciting a poem. Oh, yeah, how rude of you, Don. Go ahead. <laughs> In relation to that uh, Hutchinson, Topeka, and Kansas. Beware the jub jub bird and shun the frumious bandits. That reminds me of an incident that happened when I was in the Himalayas. I was up there with a Prince Ranji Sinji, the Getwar of Baroda and Cooch Baha. We were killing tigers and civets in deepest Darjeeling. Are you through now, Bill? For the nonce. Hand me a cup of tea, will you please? Go ahead, Miss Hutchinson. Now, this verse is especially for you, Mr. Mr. Fields. I know you appreciate good poetry. Oh, yes, I do. He took his vocal sword and... Bang, bang! We turned all the machine gun on the rhinoceros. (laughs) 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 Long time the Manxon foe he sought. Uh, The bullet struck against the rhinoceros a sick hide and launchily dropped to the ground. So rested he by the tum-tum tree... The rhinoceros looked up at us with a grateful smile. Licked up the bullets with her great big tongue. And stood a while in thought. And so she licked the bullets up with her big tongue. She thought we were feeding her Russian caviar. And as in uppish thought... Royal caviar, $80 a Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sometimes I hear a song I like so much I can't get it out of my head. This time it's a song of Hawaii. And to me it's like a rolling sea on a moonlit shore. Sweet Leilani. Sweet Leilani Heavenly power Nature fashion roses kissed with you And then she placed them in a bower It was the start of you Sweet Leilani Heavenly flower I dreamed of paradise for two. 
You are my paradise complete. You are my dream come true. summer, iced coffee becomes more and more of a favorite as a warm weather drink. But when you make it, please remember that unless you're careful, melting ice can dilute the flavor. So take two precautions. Measure your coffee a little more generously than usual, and be doubly sure to use the blend that has a richer, fuller flavor, Chase and Sanborn coffee. This blend of the world's choice coffees is guaranteed fresh and full flavored by our dating and rapid delivery plan. As soon as it's roasted, we rush it straight to your grocer, clearly marked with the delivery date. So you always get Chase and Sanborn dated coffee at the peak of its marvelous flavor. What's more, dating does away with the need for costly containers. Instead, we use an economical dated bag that saves you money. Enjoy this delicious coffee often, hot or iced. Buy a pound of Chase and Sanborn dated coffee from your grocer tomorrow. Oh, Mr. Amici... Can I ask Mr. Turby now? Now is the time, Charlie. Mr. Turby, I want you to meet Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy. How do you do? This is a great honor, Mr. Turby. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bergen. That, that goes double for me. Yes, it does. And incidentally, Mr. Turby, uh, we have a great deal in common. Really? Don't tell me. Yeah. Yes, I too am a pianist. Why shouldn't I be? I took lessons for three weeks. I paid as high as a dollar for a half-hour lesson. Do you realize what that amounts to in five years? <laughs> Charlie, you said you only studied for three weeks. Well, that's a very short time, after all. Yes, well, but it's a mess of do re mi, believe me. <laughs> I can sympathize with you, Maestro McCarthy, because in Europe I paid up to thousand dollars for a lesson, you know? Uh, is he trying to make a punk out of me? <laughs> Yes, and Mr. Turby studied for 20 years. Is that so? They must have nicked you for quite a hunk, huh? <laughs> uh, tell me, do you know Mr. Bach and Mr. Chopin? I don't think they took lessons from my teacher. <laughs> you see, it was only a sideline with her. She was married. Her husband worked at the filling station. You see that... All right, all right. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Turby is not interested in all that. No? No. I find Charlie very interesting. I beg your pardon. If he will tell me his favorite member, I will try to play for him. See, now that's nice. Uh, well, well, I don't want to embarrass you, Jose. Will uh, four sharps throw you? <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. It will be difficult, but for you, I'll try. All right. My favorite number is chopsticks. <laughs> I used to knock him in the aisles of that number. All right, but may I suggest uh, Parsifal without the orchestra or with the orchestra? Yes, you may suggest it, but I still want chopsticks. <laughs> and then there's Tchaikovsky's Symphony Pathetique. Yes. 
Gentlemen, my mind is made up. It's chopstick, and I am not to be dickered with. <laughs> Why must you be so rude, Charlie? Uh, I have... I haven't forgotten that thousand-dollar lesson crack you made. Oh, I see. <laughs> and I don't think he can even play chopsticks. If any man, not to mention any names, if he can't play it, I think he should come right out and say so rather than beat around the piano. All right, okay, I accept. I'm going to play for you, chopsticks, but may I ask you, in which key do you prefer? Which, uh, huh? Ah, <laughs> oh, it's technical, huh? <laughs> Well, Charlie, you've asked for it, and you're going to get it. Jose Turby plays Chopsticks. That Charlie is chopsticks. I've been framed, that's what I did. Yes, frankly, Charlie, you were. And the framers were Werner Jansen, who made that great musical arrangement, and, of course, Jose Iturbi at the piano. Next Sunday, at the same time, W.C. Fields, Edgar Bergen, and Charlie McCarthy, Dorothy Lamour, Werner Jansen, and I will have as our guests Ray Middleton and Constance Bennett. Until then, this is yours sincerely, Don Amici saying au revoir. <laughs> The 
heard on this program of beginner's luck from Shall We Dance, this year's kisses from On the Avenue, Sweet Lalani from Wackie Wedding, and the big show from Jerome Kern's Head Over Heels. This is the Red Network of the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs>